Sometimes teachers will say that. They get frustrated because the student can know something in class, yeah. and then they just don't retain it right. in another place. Right. Why does that happen? Yeah, and, and what they're actually uh, uh, finding out is that uh, learning is very uh, context dependent. And so the things that we know, I always think about it this way, there's really no such thing as knowing something. There's nothing that we know how to do. Instead, we have abilities to kind of conjure skills and, and, and call up thoughts of particular sorts and engage mental procedures of particular sorts given certain kinds of context and the call for those procedures and thoughts and memories. So, you know, think about if I were to take, you know, the most brilliant mathematician and hang her by her toenails over the edge of a cliff, she doesn't know what two plus two is at that moment, right? Because she's scared I'm going to drop her, you know? Um, so our knowledge, it, it, and, and her knowledge while she's hanging over the cliff is like, uh, uh, you know, totally interrupted by the fact that the context is highly unsupportive of thinking about math at that moment, you know. So, so that's just a really extreme kind of humorous example of the fact that everything that we know how to do, we know how to do within a frame of reference. We know how to do it within a context. And when knowledge is uh, fragile, when you're first learning something new, you learn it in a very context specific way. I can do my math, but only when I'm sitting at my desk at school and the teacher's standing there and she just reminded us that this is true. And then she says, and now what's the next step? And then I can do it, right? But if I take that home and I'm sitting at my kitchen table, it's like, God, I, I don't know what I, I forgot. I, it was something about the, you know, the pencil, and the, but I, what was it? You know? And then you can't call it back up because the situation has changed and it's not as supportive anymore. This is why we do worse and you know, we have test anxiety. I could do it when I was studying and then I show up in the test and I went blank because the emotional context of a test is totally different than the emotional context of the night before in your you know, house explaining it to your mom or your, you know, whoever, you know, who's around you. And so what we need to recognize is that knowledge is dynamic. It's not something you have or don't have. You can not have knowledge, but it's not ever something that you have. It's something that's shifting depending on what the context is calling for and how you're interacting with that context and how you feel in that context. Um, so you know something one day and then you screw up the next day, right? It, this is how we all are. Um, and then the other thing to remember is that knowledge is being context dependent like that in order to build it in a more flexible, more reliable way so that it, you can build it in a more different kinds of context. What you need to do to support that as a teacher is you need to help kids build knowledge first in a very fragile way. They're building it in a very supported context, very specific. We're all going to sit down this way and do our math like this. But then, as they get better and better at it, now you're going to try it in different ways. You're going to try it at home. You're going to try it, you know, teaching it to another kid. Now you're going to make a, you know, iPad video about it. Now you're going to make a game about it. You know, you want to rebuild and rebuild and re-engage that knowledge in as many different ways and contexts as you can. Now, Jenny, you're going to teach the class about it. Now you're going to help Sally, who was struggling with that, and you're going to teach it to her about it. And you're going to move around building and rebuilding. And what that also means, and I hate to say this because it makes you really unpopular, um, but uh, is that in between when you're rebuilding, you have to let it fall apart. You know, this was really Kurt Fisher's notion that I took away of, of, of what he called regression, skill regression. A natural part of learning is that we build skills and then they fall apart again. And we did it before, but now we can't do it now. And what do you have to do? You have to build it back up again. And then it falls apart again. And then you build it again. And the more times and places and ways in which you've built and rebuilt a skill, the more sort of generalizable that skill is and the more um, stable it is and the more reliable it is in many different kinds of contexts. Is, is this the same as uh, finding application in everyday life? That's a way to rebuild a skill, right? So being able to know that what I did in math class actually pertains now while I'm solving my checkbook or whatever, to notice that connection is an instance of rebuilding the skill in a new place. So I might be fantastic at doing, you know, multiplication over here, but when I'm trying to calculate my mortgage, I don't realize that that's actually the same thing. And I have to actually consciously rebuild, oh, I know how to do this. Yeah, it's, you know, it's like this. And then you build it again in a new way. And then you do that over and over. So yeah. sometimes then when a student appears to be failing, it's yeah. not failure at all. It's that's one right. of those. It's actually, they're in a period of regression where they, it's an opportunity to rebuild the skill in a new way. So we need to treat it as such. Yeah, and if you, if you, you know, punish the kid for being 
poor at it right then, then you've completely undermined the ability for them to rebuild. What you need to do is encourage them to try it again. Step back to what you could do. If you're stuck again now and you can't do this, take it back to where, where would, were you last comfortable with this domain. Go back and redo that and now step forward again and keep doing that. And if you watch natural learning in contexts that aren't uh, being orchestrated by a teacher, that's exactly what people naturally do. You try it and then you try it again and then you do it a little bit differently. That didn't work so well. And then you come back and you try it again. And kids and adults get really enamored with a particular activity and they're really focused on it and they do it and they do it and they do it for a while until they've really mastered it. And then they move on. You know, and, and so like, like for example, my son was learning a little piano piece was super struggle for him. I had two hands together in a tricky way. Super struggle for me. It worked so hard to be able to do this. I mean, it was just so frustrating. He had to take it in tiny chunks. But once he could get it together, mm -hmm. once he got at the cusp of he could almost do it, we couldn't stop him from practicing the piano. He was just, he'd walk by and he'd just sit down and he'd do it and he'd do it and he'd do it. And then he'd do it fast and he'd do it slow and he'd do it a high octave and a low octave and one hand up and one hand down. And then he started doing like this. And he just had to play that one little piece. I mean, this piece, like the Saints Go Marching In, was in everyone's head in the neighborhood for, you know, a week and a half. But nonetheless, <laughs> um, you know, he had to just play it over and over and over again in many, many different ways before he was ready to move on, before that piece was his. Yeah. Um, and we need to allow space for that because if you just push them on too fast, then they never really make the knowledge theirs and generalizable. It's only in one particular context they can do it. And lo and behold, you move into a different one, like, oh, say, the state test, and all of a sudden it falls apart. So uh, little relapses or, uh, um, you know, bumps, they're just, yeah. they're really, what they're indicating perhaps is, okay, well, right now he or she is out of their zone of safety, yeah. but that's a good but thing. But that's a good thing because they're rebuilding it in a new way. You know what I mean? They're, and you think, think about anything that you learn to do. You know, I'm cooking souffle for the first time. You try yeah. it just for your family on a Saturday and you leave all afternoon to do it and then it flops and then whatever. And then the next time you try it a little different and then you get some confidence up and you try it for a dinner party. And even though you had done it five times in a row perfectly for your family, your dinner party souffle flops, right? Because the context changed. And then you, you know, this is how learning happens. But we don't treat it like that usually in educational theories. Neural networks are very important in terms of abilities, diversity of abilities, especially we hear that as we get older. Mm -hmm. How do you build new neural networks? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, you use your mind for things that matter to you and for things that are complex and for things that are interesting and you follow your passions and you engage in the things that you care about and you try to make your life meaningful and you embed yourself in social interactions that are actually stuff that feels good to you and and you learn new things and you you know and whatever it is that matters to you playing with your grandkids or you know um, taking a hike just by yourself in the nature or learning to play a new musical instrument whatever it is that you like to do or play in bridge with your old friends whatever it is that you like to do the act of engaging with activities that you care about and that challenge you um, is how is how you keep yourself young and and and, uh, and and sharp is that the same though for say elementary learners and college level learners yeah or I should mean, they I be think forced so. to try new well things? yes they have to be forced to try new things and here's why they don't have the range of experience to know what's possible. And so the whole point, really, of education is to say, hey, you know, you're never going to bump into this in your natural daily life, but it's something you really need to understand about. So we're going to systematically sit you down and make you uh, think about it for a little while with us so that you can have an appreciation of it. I mean, you're never going to naturally discover international relations, you know, unless somebody tells you there's such a thing. You're never going to naturally discover uh, what Antarctica looks like. And, you know, if, if somebody doesn't teach you about it, if you live in, say, Wyoming, right? Because we're not in Antarctica. So, so absolutely, the job is of the teachers to say, hey, um, let me expose you to a bunch of new contexts and skills and procedures that you're not naturally going to bump into in the world because those things, you might find them really engaging and really enjoyable and they're part of what it means to be a culturally competent, cognitively sophisticated human adult in our society today. So I'm going to show you these things and I'm going to share them with you and I'm going to ask you to engage in them and try to make meaning out of them. So you have two children, uh -huh. eight-year-old and 11-year-old. Yeah. Have you learned anything from them in regards <laughs> to neural networks? Um, they're super fun. <laughs> they're adorable. No, I've actually learned a lot from my kids. I absolutely adore watching them because 
Um, well, on the one hand, you learn that actually the theories really do a great job of predicting how kids do things, which is actually quite interesting. But also, I've really gotten a new appreciation for individual differences in learning and how um, different kids come to the world with different interests, with different domains to which they're inclined, with different ways of approaching problems. And if you just stand back and encourage them to really have the self-discipline to follow their ways right, of doing things, but at the same time leave open the possibility space for what they're actually interested in, in doing, um, you just see these amazing things come out of them that just totally astound you. You know, I, my daughter is really inclined toward um, 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 verbal stuff. And, and also she's a, just a natural social scientist. She's always thinking about how people are feeling. She's always imagining all this stuff and thinking about, you know, why people do the things they do and why political events happened and all this kind of stuff. And so you see her and you think, gosh, she writes these beautiful poems about, about you know, herself and her relationships and the world and, and, and nature and all this stuff. And, 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 you know, she goes off to school and she can read when she's four and a half and, and she's just, you know, she's one of those kids that just fits right in over there and, you know, the teachers love her. She does everything she's supposed to be able to do and she's excels. Then I got my son who comes along after her who's also a super smart little dude, you know. Um, I think all kids are super smart, by the way. I don't think my kid's anything exceptional. I just love him so much and I know him so well that I can see it, but every parent should be able to see this in their kid, right? So, and, and, and he's just this natural little engineer. He's always designing and inventing and thinking about systems of things and, 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 and machines and how they could support humans better. Like, he told my mom when he was, I don't know, six maybe, he told my mom, Mom, you know, Munda, as she calls him, Mom, I'm going to grow up someday and I'm going to invent the first solar car. And I'm going to put solar panel, the car itself, the body's going to be a gigantic solar panel and it's going to drive this car and I'm going to make it a special solar car for elderly people. Because I've noticed that elderly people have a hard time getting in and out of their car seat, so it's going to have a seat that slides out and picks up so they can sit down and then it'll slide them back in. Um, and then he told her, and I'll give you one someday. And she was like, oh, well, thanks. <laughs> but, right. but still, <laughs> but still, I mean, just that, you know, he didn't write a poem. He invented a car in his head. And I think as educators, we just have to let the kids show us what they're naturally thinking about and what they're inclined towards. And we expose them to stuff they've not seen before or thought about before, and we expose them to ways of thinking that they maybe aren't inclined towards, and we engage them with that too. But then they really need a place to own their learning, to, in, to really take control of what they're thinking about, and to come up with their own ideas, and to really engage those in a way that we honor and support and respect. And when you f notice them following a particular trajectory, you know, you as the adult can say, hey, if I got this kid this and that ways to think, or if I told him about such and such, or showed him this Nova special, or had a discussion about, you know, whatever else, then I might be able to open his horizons in ways he'd never thought of before. Um, and so, you know, that's your role as an adult, to watch what the kid's inclined toward, and then to sort of support that and scaffold it so that the kid has possibilities that they couldn't have brought there themselves. Um, but it still is their knowledge and their learning and they own it and they're proud of it and they're moving it forward in a way that makes sense to them. Mary Helen, thanks for sharing. Oh, you're welcome. That's fun. Thanks for sharing your kids with us, <laughs> your research and the way your brain works. <laughs> you're welcome.